uh, as uh, we normally do um, uh, I shall look to the north and recite the first verse of Verlusvar we'll have a few words of si uh, a few moments of silence I shall light a candle and we will begin Lios bere gatla helge kindi meri o minni mörke hendala Brand a brandy brain and funny nair, funny quick is the fun of mother of money, better of mouth the cruiser until dows go up to. Flame is quickened by flame. A man from another man may become wiser, but from conceit may remain ignorant. Truth, like the sky, is above and beyond us all. Gods of our peoples and lands, may we spend this time together in friendship with you and with each other and use it to the common good with profit and with pleasure. One of the most uh, necessary expenditures of air, I think, is to introduce a speaker with a long list of past academic appointments, books, articles, awards and collected words of praise. If a speaker is worth hearing, the audience will be able to judge that when he opens his mouth. So forgive me for saying something about what I think is our guest tonight's particular metier. If someone is well read in the sources and deep thinking about the ideas themselves, which one may regard as standing outside the ostensive world, then his intuition itself can be a source of illumination that transcends the usual routes that a materialist historian or commentator must tread. For example, there's an ongoing academic debate as to the extent to which the Roman cult of Mithras derived from Persia or whether it was a more separate movement uh, created in the words of uh, Martin P. N Nielsen, who was the first person to suggest this, by an individual religious genius. Such a debate is to look at the matter on one level, below that of the metaphysical. But in matters of religion, the metaphysical is the primary level that gives significance to the others. The main thing we have to do, I think, is to know how to regard the evidences of Mithras in a way that is true to their essential essence and at the same time true to our essential essence. One might call it an exercise of mythic exegesis. If I may say so, that seems to me Jason's calling to illuminate with contemporary light, to be a myth maker rather than just a cartographer. And uh, with, 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 with those words, I very warmly invite uh, Jason to speak. Sir. Thank you, Steph. That was a very apt introduction. Uh, so I um, will get straight to the heart of the matter here because uh, there's a lot of material left from last time to present. Uh, and I believe where we left off was uh, with the introduction of Mithraism from Parthia into the Roman Empire. So I'm going to share a screen here and... Oh, All right. Yeah, I'll, sorry, I'll make you a, uh, make you, make you a co-host, sorry. Okay, so let me share screen. Uh, All right, let me just go into full screen mode here. Oh. Do you all see this presentation? Yep. Okay. Going to go back to where we were last time, yeah. where we left off. Okay, so 
the Roman Empire. So as I was suggesting toward the end of last session, Mithridates I, this Parthian king here, uh, set up a, an ostensibly pirate navy in Cilicia um, on the, uh, the Mediterranean coast of, uh, of Eastern Anatolia. And he sent the Cilician pirates into the Mediterranean as basically a black ops navy against Rome. And it's actually predominantly through the influence of the Cilician pirates on aristocratic Roman families in the port cities of the empire that Mithraism uh, spread so extensively. Uh, there were cases where you know, Parthian soldiers were uh, captured by Romans and they, uh, they wound up converting Romans to Mithraism or cases where Romans were captured in Iran and then made it back to Rome having been influenced by Mithraism. But I think the main conduit for the spread of the religion into the Roman Empire was actually quite a deliberate uh, psychological operation, let's say, by Mithridates and the Cilician pirates, whose standard was the skull and the crossbones. And as I suggested last time, the skull and the crossbones uh, is a reference to this core idea of Mithraism, that Mithra can ascend into the celestial sphere and take hold of the proverbial wheel of Mithra, the swastika, namely the the bear stars around the pole star, the bear constellations around the pole star, and use this wheel to tilt the entire heavens. In other words, to, uh, to have control over the stellar sphere that otherwise fatally de determines human existence, to have a power over fate and to become the master of one's own destiny. So the bones and the skull and crossbones uh, are separated by the same 23 degrees as the uh, ecliptic and the celestial equator. Uh, and then of course the skull is a symbol of time as death, namely the god Zorvan or Kronos as he'd be called in Greek. Another symbol that's you know, very uh, widely recognized in the Western world, which um, I think can be legitimately deciphered in terms of Mithraic ideas is the Statue of Liberty. So, you know, Bartholdi, who designed the Statue of Liberty, was a Mason. Uh, the Masons laid the cornerstone. The Grand Master of New York laid the cornerstone for the building of the Statue of Liberty. And I think a lot of Mithraic knowledge was preserved by Masonry. Specifically, if you look at the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, you'll see that uh, it incorporates imagery, or rather symbolism, from two of the different grades of initiation in uh, Mithraism. First, there's the symbolism of the second grade, uh, the grade of Nymphus or the bride, um, whose emblems are the, uh, the lunar crescent, the crescent diadem, which is here in the, the hair of uh, quote unquote Lady Liberty, and then the oil lamp. Originally, the uh, statue had an oil burning torch, uh, which was subsequently damaged and replaced. So you have the crescent diadem and then the oil lamp. And you also have an incorporation of symbols from the sixth grade of initiation, Heliodromus or the solar charioteer, namely the seven uh, spoked, uh, the seven pointed uh, halo, solar halo of Mithra, the uh, solar crown of Mithra uh, with its seven uh, rays. And then of course the torch, which uh, you know, Lady Liberty is holding in her hand. And one thing you'll notice about this statue is that, I mean, you can't discern any breasts in this figure. This statue was passed off as a representation of Columbia or you know, the Liberty Goddess. But really, there's nothing to indicate that this is a female. This appears to be uh, an esoteric representation of a Mithraic initiate garbed as a female, as an initiate would have been in the second grade of initiation ceremony, the grade of the bride. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think we have here in New York Harbor, Mithra as a representation of enlightenment and liberty. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to note in passing, uh, as we go on to, to explore that idea of Mithra and liberty uh, and why Mithra is associated with liberation, um, that 
you see in this, this image of the soldier saluting the Statue of Liberty, this military salute itself, this, uh, you know, military salute is actually Mithraic in origin, just as the handshake is. The Mithraic salute that's become our military salute is a shielding of one's eyes from the solar glory of one's commander in the guise of Mithra or one's king in the guise of Mithra. It's a shielding of the eyes from the solar glory, uh, which you know obviously would have significance in terms of Mithraism being the predominant religion of the military. So Mithra and liberty. The liberty cap of the French Revolution is simply the Phrygian cap or the cap worn by the Mithraists. Right, and uh, this is uh, incorporated into the symbolism of the final grade of initiation, the grade of, of Pater or the father, the Pir as it's called in Persian, um, together with this harpy sword. Uh, so this cap wound up being associated with rebellion against tyranny in European history. And funnily enough, it even survives in American popular culture in terms of the cap of the Smurfs. Mm. Right, who are you know rebelling uh, uh, amidst their their uh, you know uh, Amanita habitat against some tyrant uh, in the forest? So this uh, predominantly red liberty cap uh, wound up having a long life, extending all the way into the French Revolution, undoubtedly through Masonic influence, um, and it, it remains uh, one of the symbols of uh, liberty. So why why an association between Mithra and liberty? It has everything to do with the fact that uh, Mithraism was an initiatic uh, secret society. The idea of grades of initiation in the context of a society like the Roman Empire is an idea of meritocracy. So if you were you know, uh, a member of, a royal, of the royal family in Rome and you joined a Mithraeum, you were not necessarily uh, well, not, I mean, that's, that's putting it too lightly. You were inferior to a brother of yours in the order who was a peasant, but who had reached a higher grade of initiation. So within the context of the secret society of the Mithraeum, and this is one of the reasons why it had to remain a secret society, because it was threatening to the socio-political class system of Rome. Within that context of the uh, initiatic order of Mithraism, you were evaluated based on your level of wisdom and spiritual achievement, not based on your social class and background. So if you were you know, the, the son of a Caesar, you had to defer to a brother of yours who was a common soldier, but who had reached a higher rank of initiation than you had. Or even you might potentially be initiated by such a person. So. Uh, Mithra is a god of liberty insofar as Mithraism represented meritocracy. The fasces is also a Mithraic symbol. You see the fasces in Iran uh, long before you see it in Europe. It was called the barsom in Iran. Uh, it's this bundle of sticks that are, uh, that's held by Mithra uh, in this rock carving uh, with the idea of course being that there's strength and unity that you know, one uh, stick by itself can easily be broken, but a bundle of them well bound together is unbreakable. And uh, in ancient Iran, putting an ax inside of the barsum meant that you were going to war. It was a symbol, not only of strength and unity, but of strength and unity in a time of war. So the fascist is another symbol that I think uh, entered Europe through the spread of Mithraism in the Roman empire. And we see it survive all the way into the French revolution again, where you see here on, on uh, the side, um, a, uh, an image of the Declaration de Droit de l'Homme, and it has the um, Barsom or Fascis right in the center of it. So here is a reconstruction of a Mithraeum with the various grades of initiation uh, in the mosaic floor, the same Mithraeum um, lit differently. And here's the, uh, the site that was actually used as a basis for this reconstruction. And here you can see the various grades of initiation. And I can expand upon this in Q&A, but let me very briefly just uh, give you 
a summary of my interpretation of the various grades of initiation and what they represent. So this is the first grade, the grade of the, the grade of the, they call it the Raven initiate. Um, and uh, it's symbol, the symbols associated with it are the caduceus and the raven. And this was basically a confrontation with death. Uh, you were put through torturous uh, rituals that were meant to terrify you and confront you with the imminence of your mortality. Um, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, however controversial it may be, people were sometimes killed in Mithraea. They, there was a rite where uh, the initiate uh, was basically subjected to a, um, uh, the, the initiator would take aim at the initiate with an arrow. And sometimes uh, this like, um, this uh, initiatic archery would actually end in the death of a putative initiate. So I think that the Mithraists would occasionally bring people into the Mithraeum who they had no real intention of initiating. And sometimes political assassinations would be carried out there with the idea that uh, the danger of death uh, would be taken more seriously by an initiate if they were aware of the fact that occasionally people would be killed in these initiations. So the confrontation with, with mortality, um, the ritual of which ended uh, with the uh, laying of the initiate into a crypt, um, a rite that you know is preserved by, for example, skull and bones to this day, was the first first grade of initiation. The second grade of initiation was the bride or nymphus, and uh, as I suggested briefly last time, I think the idea there is that you could confront your own mortality courageously, but you could do it from out of um, a kind of prideful egotism. And so the aim of the second grade of initiation of becoming the bride which involved a certain degree of, let's say, ritual humiliation. I can expand on that later, uh, but this dressing up as a transvestite basically um, and submitting to certain kind of ritual humiliation was meant to uh, be an overcoming of pride and an annihilation of the ego, which prepared you for the third stage of initiation where you become a soldier of Mithra. And there in the, the grade of the soldier, uh, the idea is that you are becoming a perfect instrument uh, of Mithra. It's uh, the kind of self-discipline necessary to functioning in a chain of command. But uh, the common soldier, the foot soldier on the battlefield uh, is one who takes orders, not one who commands or is responsible for strategizing. And so the next grade of initiation, the grade of the lion or Leo, uh, I think is meant to represent what they call the uh, Shir Mardan in Persian or Shir Mard, who is a, a uh, kind of lionine champion or hero, a chivalric knight who is not just a foot soldier capable of self-discipline, but someone who has the capacity to strategize and to command on a battlefield, to take initiative and to command on a battlefield. So that, that uh, to my mind is the meaning of the grade of Leo. Uh, after that, as the fifth grade of initiation, you have uh, Perses. If you recall from last time in Greek folk religion, there was this idea which the Persians uh, would often exploit in order to gain influence in Greece. There was this idea in Greek folk religion that the Persians were the descendants of the son of Perseus uh, uh, by Andromeda. So the union of Perseus and Andromeda um, yields uh, Perses as an offspring and Perses is seen as the patriarch of the Persians. So there's a relationship between this fifth grade of initiation and the pater, the, the final grade of initiation insofar as the father is supposed to be Perseus or Mithra. Uh, in the fifth grade of initiation, um, I, I uh, think that uh, we're seeing in terms of the symbolism of, do they even have this symbolism of the fifth grade here? No, they don't. But uh, the symbols of the fifth grade are basically the, um, the uh, um, scythe or um, what do you call it? Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the harvest, the reaper, yeah, so, the harvesting. Sickle, sickle. Yeah. sickle, yeah, yeah. Sickle, sorry, it was escaping me. Yeah, so the sickle, um, the sickle and the harpy sword of Perseus are the symbols for this grade of initiation. 
And I think that in the context of Mithraic cosmology and Mithraic ideas about the coming harvest at the end of the world, uh, this grade of initiation is the one where you reach the point where you're going to survive the harvest. When the wheat will be separated from the chaff, you will be uh, harvested uh, together with those who go on uh, to, to endure past the end of, um, you know, uh, the end of the world that's going to be purified by fire. And when we talk about the purification of the world by fire, we're already talking about the symbolism of the next grade of initiation, which is Heliodromus or the solar charioteer. The idea with the solar charioteer was that um, Mithra uh, rides in a chariot with a torch, which ultimately will be used at the end of the cycle of ages to set the world on fire. And a version of this survived in Greek mythology as the myth of, of Phaeton's uh, fall to the earth and the setting of the earth ablaze. Uh, and so this is the Fereshgard idea in, in uh, Iranian theology that at the end of history, there's gonna be a global conflagration which will act as a kind of alchemical furnace that purifies the world. So in the grade of the solar charioteer, where you have this torch in hand, the same torch that Lady Liberty is holding up in New York Harbor, uh, and you also have this whip. Okay, this is the symbolism of the grade of the solar charioteer, the solar halo, the torch, and then the whip for the horses driving the solar chariot. You are at a point where you have the discernment to judge who survives and who doesn't survive the apocalypse. So it's not just that you've reached a level of understanding requisite for enduring this uh, global alchemical transformation. In the grade of the solar charioteer, you've risen above that and are in the position of a judge over the world. And then the final grade of initiation, uh, or rather the culmination of the initiatic process is to become the pater uh, or uh, Perseus, or basically to become an incarnation of Mithra or a, or a vehicle of Mithra. So uh, that's the, uh, the grade symbolized by the ring um, and the wand or staff of the magician uh, and the Phrygian cap um, and also again see this uh, curved sword which to this day in the symbolism of uh, the Iranian national standard the lion and the sun you see this curved sword in the hands of the lion okay so here are a few more pictures of Mithraea and you can see here uh, this is the London Mithraeum of course and you can see here in this reconstruction how the initiates would be, or uh, rather uh, the brothers of the order would be seated on these couches with the initiation taking place in the central corridor. Now this is, uh, you know, worthy of note here, uh, this sculpture in terms of uh, the various animals depicted. Ulansi in his book on uh, the Mithraic mysteries interprets these animals, the dog and the serpent and uh, the scorpion and so forth as um, stellar uh, symbology, that these are constellations associated with Perseus and Taurus. And so that this is further evidence that what we're being presented with here is a kind of star map and uh, you know astrological symbolism. I'm not so sure about that. I think that if you look at this from an Iranian perspective, there's another possible interpretation, which is that, as we discussed last time, Mithra is the mediator between Ormazd or Ahura Mazda and Ahriman, between the forces of light and good and the forces of darkness and evil, between truth and deceit, right? And in Zoroastrianism, certain animals were associated with uh, Ahura Mazda and the good creation and other animals were considered Ahrimanic or demonic. The, the dog in particular was a very sacred animal who uh, you know, uh, became man's best friend as it were in archaic Iran in, in the first instance, because it was believed that dogs would guard your home from demons, that they could see demons and they would bark to ward off demons, right? So the dog is a holy animal 
And then the serpent is considered an Ahrimanic animal. And the fact that you have the dog and the serpent both uh, sort of, you know, licking at this wound uh, where Mithra is, is uh, beginning to slay the bull, to me suggests again, Mithra as a mediator between the forces of good and evil or Mithra as one who ultimately has surmounted this um, moral and cosmological dichotomy. So that's another uh, possible interpretation that I would offer. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also these figures that you see on the sides, um, uh, one of them holds a torch upwards and the other one holds a torch downwards. Uh, Ulancey and others, I think, have interpreted these as symbols of the, uh, win uh, of the um, yeah, winter and summer solstices. Uh, but again, I think you could see them as Ormazd and Ahriman, the one who is, is dousing the light and the one who is holding, upholding the light. So why do I have this Vesica Pisces in here? As we transition to the later Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity, uh, I think it's, it's uh, uh, valuable to pause for a moment uh, and, and uh, reflect on uh, the potential origins of this Vesica symbol. Mithraism was an astrological religion where the transition between world ages was of tremendous symbolic significance. So this image of uh, Ares slaying Taurus okay, and changing the age by turning the wheel of Mithra would no longer have been relevant to the dawning of the age of Pisces. So if we had Mithraists in the Roman Empire, or for that matter in Parthia, at the moment when there's a transition to the age of Pisces, it's reasonable to speculate that they would have needed a new symbol. And that the symbol for that would have been the fish. Okay, so there's something else besides that uh, that makes this Vesica a perfect uh, symbol for Mithraism. And that's the idea of mediation. Mithra is the great mediator between the two spheres of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit. And the Vesica is again a perfect uh, you know, emblem of um, mediation and of the kind of Trinitarian thought that you see in the Trinity of Ormazd, Ahriman, and Mithra. So I suggest that the, the Vesica may actually have had Mithraic origins and like so much else was adopted into Christianity. Um, and here's you know, a couple of examples of some of this symbolic adoption from Mithraism into Christianity, the, the vestments and the, the meter of the bishop, uh, or for example, the ashen cross um, that uh, is put on the forehead of a, of a believer on Ash Wednesday. This comes right out of the uh, ritual of initiation for the grade of the soldier. In the, uh, the right of the grade of the soldier, the soldier initiate would be smacked on the face the way that a person is during confirmation, and he would have an ashen cross put on his forehead, symbolizing the crossing of the ecliptic and the, uh, the um, celestial equator, and also symbolizing in terms of the ash, the burning of the world at the end of time. Uh, and during this ritual also, they would, they would, uh, the father would, by the point of a sword, put a crown on top of the uh, initiate's head and the initiate would throw off the crown and say, my crown is my Lord, Mithras is my Lord. And so uh, this initiate would never wear a crown even in the form of a wreath at banquets ever again, with the idea being that he's a soldier of Mithra or as the Christians translated it, a soldier of Christ. Okay, so before, why, why in the world would the Romans adopt Christianity as an official religion? Before Christianity was adopted by Constantine as the religion of the Roman Empire, Mithraism reached such a degree of prominence that even Caesars were becoming initiates uh, in Mithraic orders. There is evidence to suggest that both Nero Caesar and Commodus were Mithraists. Uh, and Mithraism also uh, was deeply entrenched enough so that after the institutionalization of Christianity by Constantine, there was an attempt made by Julian, uh, who was a, another Mithraic initiate, to 
revert to Mithraism and to institutionalize Mithraism rather than Christianity. So I think that the fact that uh, this religion had become not only predominant among the Roman military, but that Caesars themselves were beginning to uh, adopt Mithraism posed a grave national security threat uh, to the Roman establishment. And so whatever machinations were involved in the amalgamation of uh, this Jewish sect with certain elements of Mithraism and other mystery schools to create Christianity, the uh, main consideration there was the defense of, of uh, Rome uh, from a potential psychological warfare operation at the hands of the Parthians, that somehow the Parthians were waging not just military campaigns with Rome, but a spiritual battle that might end in the spiritual conquest of the Roman Empire and of the ultimately the falling of the uh, wall between Rome and Parthia and the creation of an integrated Indo-European imperium, which frankly, if you ask me, uh, wouldn't have been such a bad thing. But I think that this was one of the main considerations uh, in terms of the institutionalization of Christianity. Now, uh, in terms of Christianity, one of the most controversial points that I wanna make, and unfortunately we don't have the time for me to belabor it, um, is a point about Apollonius of Tiana uh, and, a, uh, and a point that's relevant to the question of who this Christ really was, who showed up um, in what became you know, the early years of the common era. There was a Roman empress by the name of Julia Domna, the wife of Septimius Severus. And here she is with her, her husband, the Caesar, uh, Septimius Severus and uh, their son. And uh, here they are depicted on a, on a Kushan coin from Northern India. They were so renowned that the Mithraists of Northern India were minting coins with their portraits on them. This is a reconstruction of Julia Domna from one of the busts of her. This woman was a Syrian and by all accounts, her family were Mithraists. She marries Septimius Severus and uh, around 200 uh, CE, she commissions Philostratus to write the life of Apollonius of Tiana. This woman who had the solar charioteer uh, struck on the back of coins bearing her portrait. This Luna Lucifera is inscribed over the solar charioteer. Uh, Julia Felix Augustus, a woman who had coins struck with her portrait on it during the time that her husband was Caesar of Rome. This woman commissions Philostratus to write the life of Apollonius of Tiana. Not only was she from a Mithraic background, it said that she was a deep student of philosophy. And I think that what Julia Domna was trying to do as a Mithraist uh, was to basically militate against the perversion of the mission of Apollonius of Tiana in Judea by certain uh, Judaic and Roman uh, political interests. So if you read the, the uh, biography of Apollonius of Tiana, you'll see that this man who was born basically at the same time as Jesus, went to Judea among other places. And his custom was that whenever he would teach his esoteric philosophy somewhere, he would adopt the language and the symbology of the local people. So he would try to teach them this esoteric wisdom in a terminology that they would understand and that had the best chance of transforming their own tradition in a positive way. So Apollonius goes to Judea and uh, you know, if you think about it, the title Yeshua or Jesus is actually, I mean, it's a title in Hebrew, it's an honorific, it means savior or redeemer. So it's not necessarily, necessarily a personal name. For all we know, Apollonius speaking Aramaic in Judea was referred to as Yeshua by the Jews who he taught there. Not only does he perform all of the same miracles as Jesus, he ultimately uh, falls afoul of the Roman authorities and they wind up attempting to crucify him. He escapes crucifixion, travels through Persia and uh, spends his old age in India, which is exactly the account of the life of Jesus that were given by certain Muslims and other people in the East, particularly in Kashmir, where the Kashmiris claim to locally host 
the tomb of Jesus. So I thought this was noteworthy because Apollonius, who was a uh, practitioner of astrological magic, these are some of the uh, talismanic seals of Apollonius of Tiana that were preserved by Arabs who referred to him as Balinus. Apollonius was from a, a part of Anatolia, which was the most heavily Mithraic region near Judea. This area in Cappadocia, uh, between Cappadocia and Cilicia, uh, which is where uh, Apollonius was from, which is where the city of Tiana is, this area was the center of Mithraism uh, in that part of the world. And it had become so, these are reconstructions of sites in Cappadocia. It had become so because this man, Mithridates VI, the king of Pontus, established a Mithraic empire on both sides of the Black Sea. Uh, this is a, a monument set up to him at the bottom of the screen there. This is a monument set up to uh, Mithridates or Mehrdad VI in Crimea, the uh, territory that uh, Putin has taken back from the Ukraine recently. So uh, this uh, Mithridates um, spread Mithraism throughout this entire area from out of the heart of which Apollonius of Tiana emerges in, in, in an area close to where the Cilician pirates used to be launched into the Mediterranean by Mithridates I. So Apollonius not only has a teaching which is Mithraic, he, his name evokes the sun, Apollo was often analogized with Mithra, but he's also coming from out of the heart of uh, the, the uh, uh, or rather the bastion of Mithraism that's closest to Judea. Uh, and then finally, as I uh, suggested earlier, despite the failure of Julia Domna's attempt to set the record straight regarding uh, Apollonius as the true Christos, um, another attempt is made by Caesar Julian who tries to reverse Constantine's decision and as late as you know, the, the late 300s, uh, yet again attempts to institutionalize Mithraism in the Roman Empire rather than Christianity. So that brings us to the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, and I see that I'm gonna have to step up the pace drastically, but let me just say a few things about what goes on in the medieval uh, period. So you have all these barbarians flooding into the collapsing Roman Empire. And a huge misconception is that these were all Germanic barbarians. Actually, there were as many Iranian barbarians coming into the collapsing Roman Empire as there were uh, Germanic barbarians. And one of the reasons for the confusion is that these Sarmatians, or Alans as they came to be called in Europe, that flooded in to uh, collapsing Rome, were so closely interrelated with the Goths and intermixed with the Goths that the Romans often couldn't tell the difference between them. Uh, and even today, when archaeologists open the tombs of Sarmatians and they open the tombs of Goths, it, they have to take great pains to uh, be able to distinguish the two. In fact, the Sarmatians, or Alans, teamed up with the Goths to found certain kingdoms, including, for example, the kingdom of Goth Alania in Spain, which was corrupted as Catalonia. Catalonia is a linguistic corruption of Goth Alania, an Irano-Germanic kingdom that was co-founded by the Sarmatians and the Goths in Spain. So these Sarmatians that poured into the collapsing Roman Empire were also Mithraists. They were closely related to the Scythians and they were also Mithraists. These are the people who invented scale armor. And their banner was the dragon, the Draco, which eventually became the Roman banner, the Roman war banner. And the reason it became the Roman war banner is that these fighters were so good that whenever they were defeated, they were recruited into the Roman military if possible. Marcus Aurelius took thousands and thousands of these Sarmatians who he defeated in battle, and he sent them to Hadrian's Wall in Britain with the idea being that he wanted them to be as far away from possible, uh, as far away as possible from their homeland, so they couldn't act as insurgents against the empire, but they could be grade A fighters for the empire. So he takes these uh, chivalric, Mithraic knights in shining armor, okay, a accoutrement that didn't exist in Europe prior to the entry of Sarmatians into Europe, Sarmatians who invented scale armor, he takes them and he stations them at Hadrian's Wall um, under, I'll come back to this if I have time. He takes them to Hadrian's Wall 
and he stations them under the command of a certain Artorius, a Roman commander named Artorius. And these Sarmatians, lock, stock, and barrel took their Mithraic mythology, which you still find in the Nart sagas in Ossetia today. They took their Mithraic mythology about Batras, their hero king, the lady of the lake who bestows the sacred sword upon warriors, the sword in the stone, which the Mithraists worship as an emblem of their god. They took all of this mythology and they transposed it upon Artorius, who was their Roman commander and who apparently was a tremendously charismatic figure uh, who led them you know, in, in Britain. And so this is a thesis presented by uh, Littleton and Malcor in From Scythia to Camelot, a book that I uh, you know, strongly recommend. Uh, and so the suggestion is that the Arthurian chivalric culture and the grail mysticism associated with it actually were transplanted from uh, Northern Iran to Europe and that they're uh, Mithraic uh, in essence. The, the grail, the sword, all of these symbols, the, the sword that's uh, bestowed upon the hero by a goddess figure who lives underneath a lake and who takes heroes to this occulted realm beneath the waters and initiates them and bestows a broadsword upon them. And the idea of a grail that shows you the whole world, Jalmid Jahan Nama, as it's called in Persian, or Jalmid Jamshid, these are all Iranian ideas that you see in uh, European grail mysticism. And of course, the round table uh, is very consistent with uh, Mithraic ideas of meritocracy. So uh, here's a depiction of, um, as she was called, Shatana or Satana, the lady of the lake of the Sarmatians. Uh, mm. The Sarmatians worshiped the dragon and their standard uh, was the dragon, right? Which becomes the Draco emblem of Rome. Whenever you see a dragon show up in Iranian iconography, like in depictions from the Shah Nameh, I think that this is a reference to Persians fighting Sarmatians. So the dragons that are slayed on the battlefield by Persian champions are actually Sarmatians who are, who are uh, you know, the Persians are triumphing over, okay? And I uh, suspect, and again, I discussed this in Iranian Leviathan, that the order of the dragon, which emerges from out of the Sarmatian heartland in Romania, Hungary, and so forth, the order of the dragon that protected Eastern Europe from the Turks was probably Sarmatian in origin. Uh, you know, Vlad Dracul, who impaled all these Turks as they were attempting to conquer Europe just when the Renaissance was budding in Italy, and should they have been successful, we would never have seen the European Renaissance. Vlad Dracul, I think, uh, probably was a descendant of Sarmatian uh, nobility. And uh, so, you know, you had these, these um, you know, uh, esoteric dragon knights in Europe. Uh, enduring for centuries mm. into the medieval period. Um, and okay, so the point that I'm trying to make here is that the chivalric ethos that we often associate with you know, the European knightly culture actually has an origin in Parthian Iran. It's far, uh, you know, it far predates medieval Europe and that's also the case with the idea of, uh, you know, romance that you see uh, promulgated by the troubadours in, let's say, the 1100s and the 1200s uh, in Europe. The romantic ideal that's associated with the chivalric culture and with these very, you know, uh, independent women who, who ran, you know, uh, basically uh, feudal realms um, in, uh, you know, in uh, Alanic Europe, this uh, culture can be found already in the second century BC in Iran. And one example of that is uh, the, the uh, romantic poem Ves and Ramin by Fakhruddin Gorgani. People who've analyzed Ves and Ramin, which originally dates to the Parthian period and was rewritten in, um, in the 10 hundreds in Iran, 900s, 10 hundreds in Iran. Vais and Ramin has been identified by some scholars as the prototype for Tristan and Isolde. Uh, and uh, 
mean, somebody should really make, I mean, if we had a better uh, regime in, in, in power in Iran by now, uh, there'd have been some Akira Kurosawa Ron style film made of this uh, romantic epic. It's, it's uh, quite incredible. I mean, the, there's so much, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, erotic imagery in this that to this day it's censored in Iran. In any case, the idea of romantic love, we've been told, was a product of, you know, the late medieval period and it uh, didn't exist in, in classical Europe. I mean, this is what scholars tell us. But it's very clear that it existed in uh, Parthian Iran and it's entirely consonant with the spirit of Mithraism that as a free spirited person, you would you know, freely choose who your beloved is and not be subject to these customary social conventions. Okay, and the rebellion against those social conventions is at the heart of this narrative in, in base and Ramin. So you have this Iranian precedent for the, myth, for the chivalric culture of Europe that's uh, basically Mithraic in nature. And it includes, for example, the uh, worship of, of uh, swords that are planted in the earth or set up on stone altars. Mm. I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this from the people in the Iranian opposition. Uh, but if you look at the flag of the Islamic Republic of Iran, even to this day, this symbol that's referred to as the Allah Lale or the Allah Tulip, supposedly Allah mirrored in two directions and depicted as a tulip. This is an entirely Mithraic symbol uh, that somebody snuck into this uh, flag effectively. If you, you look at this, first of all, just on the face of it, they call it the Allah uh, Tulip. It was believed that red tulips would grow from the blood of martyred knights. In the Mithraic culture of ancient Iran, the martyrdom of a chivalric knight was symbolized by a red tulip. So, you know, rom they would romantically, they would say fields of red tulips are fields where the Mithraic heroes died, right? And then you look at this particular red tulip and there's a downward planted broadsword in it waiting to be pulled out by the hero. So I think this is one of uh, you know, those examples of uh, esoteric symbolism encoded in a modern context. And by no means is it the only survival of Mithraism in Iran today, the entire culture of Zurkhanes or houses of strength, which you find in, in basically every, not only Iranian city, but every town and hamlet practically in Iran. Okay, this house of strength is essentially a Mithraic martial arts dojo that has survived more or less in its original form to this day, down to the uh, hymns that are recited in it, which are often from the Shahnameh or the Epic of Kings, an epic whose central hero is Rostam, a Scythian Mithraist, mm. which, I, uh, which I mentioned last time. Okay. Okay. So oh. the Zur Khanes, the houses of strength where Persian martial arts are practiced are surviving Mithraic institution uh, that's widespread in Iran to this day. Here are some uh, uh, old rock carvings of um, knights in shining armor. You see how uh, in ancient Iran, many centuries before the medieval epoch in Europe, we already had the symbolism of lance bearing knights uh, fully clad in armor with armored horses and so forth, which uh, I think spread into Europe as an aesthetic uh, together with Mithraism. Mm -hmm. All right, we're very short on time, but give me another well, ten minutes or so well, here. Because... Please, please, Jason. I, I don't think I don't think anyone would, would want to miss anything of this. It's, right. it's fascinating. Right. This uh, this uh, episode is particularly important. So these carvings are from the Sasanian period. They're at a place called Taghebostan in um, Kurdish dominant region of Iran, and they date to the Sasanid period. Now something happens in the Sassanid period, which begins around 200 AD um, and which overlaps mostly with Byzantine, early Byzantine history in Europe. The main rivals of the Sassanids are the Byzantine Empire. Something happens in the Sassanid period that gives us tremendous insight into uh, Mithraism and fleshes out what the Mithraic esoteric doctrine must have been. The Sassanids are the ones who institutionalized Zoroastrianism in its most orthodox form. The founder of the dynasty, Ardashir Babakan, was uh, from a family of priests 
okay, based in the Pars province of Iran, the province from which the name Persia derives. And so coming from this family of priests, Ardashir creates for the first time an orthodox puritanical Zoroastrian doctrine, and he attempts to institutionalize it as a state religion, all right? And to do that, he persecutes the Mithraists. He goes around Iran, shutting off the fires, dousing the fires of all the Mithraic fire temples, probably burning their libraries because we have very little literature left from the Parthian period. And we know that the Parthian fire temples and, and Mithraea were used as book depositories and libraries. So he probably torched their literature. And he set up an inquisitorial apparatus of repression to basically stamp out Mithraism and replace it with his conception of Orthodox Zoroastrianism. And in doing so, he also sidelined the Parthian Knights. So, you know, Parthia was a confederacy. It was a feudal uh, federation that relied on uh, knights in the service of feudal lords to join together to protect the realm. But, you know, the Game of Thrones kind of style, right, uh, system. Mm -hmm. And with each family having its own standard and so on and so forth, each house having its own standard. So these Parthian houses were sidelined by Ardashir when he set up the Sassanid dynasty. And he created instead a national military to defend Iran. But this national military often needed to, to uh, call on the assistance of these local feudal lords, all right? So you have this tremendous tension between the sideline Parthians and the central Sassanid state with its attempted Zoroastrian orthodoxy. This is the capital of the uh, Sassanid empire, which uh, unfortunately is in Iraq today. You know, Iraq is a fake country that spent more than half of its history, uh, not just as part of Iran, but as the capital of Iran. Okay, so the capital district of Iran was in present day Iraq for more than half of um, the history of Mesopotamia. In this capital, at this site, uh, the palace of uh, Ctesiphon, there's an event that took place around about 500 um, AD that's tremendously uh, significant for Mithraism. A king by the name of Kavad the first appoints a prime minister named Mazdak. And this Mazdak institutes a series of reforms that are Mithraic in nature. And they're extremely uh, drastic reforms that include the forcible redistribution of the wealth of the aristocracy. He went in and seized the grain in their granaries and uh, had it distributed to the poor. It involved the breaking up of increasingly large harems and the liberation of the women who were held captive in them. The uh, disestablishment of necessarily monogamous marriage and a kind of communal attitude toward uh, you know, uh, fostering the development of children uh, and an overall concern with uh, you know, what now a term that, you know, an idea that now has been uh, irremediably muddied namely social justice, okay? So Mithra is the god of justice. And there were a, a number of drastic reforms in the name of a more just society that took place under the direction of this prime minister, Mazdak. And the promulgation of ideas such as reincarnation uh, and the transcendence of the duality of light and darkness, which are at the heart of Mithraism, right? The Roman authors, um, in the period when Mithraism was spreading through the Roman Empire, in the period when Parthia was challenging Rome, the Roman authors writing about Mithraism told us that there were magi who taught reincarnation. And you know, we know that Pythagoras, who spent a dozen years uh, studying under the magi at the capital of the Persian Empire, came back to Greece with the alien idea of reincarnation. So it appears that you know, reincarnation, which is a central tenet of Mazdak's teaching around about 500 AD, was also an important element of Mazdakism. And the most controversial aspect of this Mazdakite revolution was the notion that in order to have a just society, you need to overcome the power of five demons over the human soul, uh, lust, greed, um, anger, uh, vengeance, um, and uh, uh, 
lust, greed, anger, vengeance, and uh, um, envy. Okay, so these five demons, envy, lust, greed, anger, and vengeance, were uh, seen as uh, passions that afflict the human soul through the malevolent astral influence of the planets. So you remember I was discussing last time how Mithraic initiation is in part uh, a process of gaining power over the planets that have a malefic influence on human life and that um, uh, basically bind us to fatalism. And so in order to become masters of our destiny, we have to uh, overcome these planetary forces, these astrological baneful influences. And in particular, Mazdak taught that these express themselves as these five demons, right? And to overcome these five demons, we need to be able to uh, break the uh, break the uh, the bind of the fixation on private property and a possessive relationship toward women. So he he taught basically that the root of all strife in society ultimately involves disputes over property and uh, basically lustful uh, possession over women and vengeance in terms of the control of women and of wealth. And so through this kind of um, let's say attitude of, of free love and ultra romantic conception of uh, you know the relationship between men and women and through a forcible redistribution of wealth you had a serious challenge posed to the Sassanid state orthodoxy. Now you might think that such a radical revolution would collapse within a few years. It endured for an entire generation. The Mazdakites were in power for close to 30 years. Um, and they were only overthrown once the uh, Magi, the, 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 actually it's an insult to the Magi to call them Magi. Once the Mobeds or Zoroastrian priests of the Sassanid Orthodoxy uh, convinced the heir to Kavad, namely Khosro, to conspire against his father uh, and basically bring Mazdak to this palace at Ketesaphon, subject him to an inquisitorial trial, uh, and basically act as a judge, jury, and executioner uh, in, uh, in a proceeding that ended with Mazdak being led out into the palace gardens where he witnessed his followers planted as human trees into the earth with their legs kicking in the air. Uh, and you know, they, Mazdak was told, you wanted to turn this earth into a paradise. You wanted to make a paridaiza, a, a heaven on earth. Here's your heavenly garden. And after being shown this gruesome spectacle of you know, his uh, followers planted into the, the palace gardens, he was strung up uh, head down and um, shot through with arrows. Following that, Khosro, the heir to Kavad I, executed about 100,000 of the most prominent Mazdakites, which scaled to today's population is an execution of well, at least a million people, if not more, uh, and publicly burned their scriptures in bonfires, okay? Uh, so this Khosro, who's widely revered as an ideal Zoroastrian monarch uh, by uh, the Parsis to this day, um, carried out this massive uh, reprisal against the Mazdakites. Now, here's where this is uh, particularly relevant to Mithraism in a political sense. How in the hell could such a radical reformer take control of the state without some kind of political and economic backing, right? I mean, who was really in control, Kavad or Mazdak? Based on my research into the subject, uh, and there's, there are a number of good books on this, Decline and Fall of the Sasanian Empire is one that addresses the subject. It appears that the sidelined Parthian nobility, who were Mithraists, are the ones who put Mazdak forward as their vehicle and representative. And it was effectively Mazdak who was controlling Kavad. And what this whole 30 year episode represented was a Mithraic coup d'etat against the Sassanid state, which ultimately met its demise. But you can imagine that these Mithraists would have had an ax to grind. And so after the collapse of the Sassanid empire at the hands of the invading Arabs, these Mithraists, the, the noble, uh, Parthian feudal houses are the people who spearhead 
the Iranian Renaissance or the, the Iranian Intermezzo as it's often called, uh, the period of the flourishing of the sciences and the arts after the initial Arab onslaught on Iran. So uh, beginning in the 900s and going up to about 1100 when the Turks invade Iran, there's a tremendous flourishing of the sciences and the arts, which is patroned by Parthian nobility, by Mithraists coming from out of this heavily forested band around the Caspian Sea, right? Uh, and it yielded two dynasties, the Buyid dynasty and the Samanid dynasty. One of them, as you can see here, the one on the top, the Buyid dynasty expanded to the south uh, and the Samanid dynasty expanded to the east. And these were both uh, you know, coming from out of uh, Parthian feudal houses in the north of Iran. And you also saw Mithraic religious revolts against Sunni Islam. One of these, the revolt led by Sunbad or Sinbad, had the sun as its standard, uh, had reincarnation as a central tenant, and the followers of Sunbad coming from out of northern Iran actually aimed to march to Mecca, conquer Mecca, and destroy the Kaaba. Okay, so such was the scale of Mithraic resurgence in the years following the collapse of the Sassanid Empire and the opening of a socio-political vacuum in Iran. And a good resource on that is the nativist prophets of early Islamic Iran. Uh, I thought I would include some images of this heavily forested band around the Caspian Sea in northern Iran because you know mm. uh, it gives you a sense of the, the environment that these Mithraists were surrounded by uh, and that I think nourished the you know, soul of their teachings and the spirit of their revolts. This is a part of Iran that's indistinguishable from the geography of much of Europe or uh, New England uh, in America. Hmm. And it's the last bastion of Mithraism after the Arab Muslim conquest of Iran. I don't think that the relationship between the land and the mentality is incidental. So this area is known as Hyrcania. And there are a number of fortresses in Hyrcania, in this area, uh, which were used as strongholds against the Arabian Caliphate. In particular, this figure, Babak Khurramdin, was a person who clearly identified himself as a Mazdakite. His movement was an extension of Mazdakism, right? Mazdak is executed around 530 AD. The Arabs come in a century later, 630 AD. In the 800s, this man is still promulgating Mazdak's version of Mithraism. Contemplate that. I mean, the United States of America is 250 years old. Mazdak is executed in 530. In the 800s AD, this man, Babak Khorramdin, is still a Mazdakite Mithraist fighting the Sunni Muslims, fighting the Arabian Caliphate. And uh, scale to the population of our time, this guy kills a couple of million people to defend Iran from the Arabian Caliphate before ultimately being betrayed and defeated. And again, he does so from the Mithraic stronghold of Hyrcania in the northern forested region of Iran. This is also the area that uh, the, the Persian national poet Ferdosi comes from out of. Ferdosi, um, Ferdosi's patrons were the Samanid dynasty, the ones who, as I said, uh, spread their realm to the east from out of Hyrcania. And uh, they become the patrons of Ferdowsi to write the Shah Nameh uh, that becomes the national epic. And you know, the central hero of the Shah Nameh is a Mithraic warlord, a Mithraic knight, namely Rostam, who's a Scythian, not a Persian. And when you go to the tomb of Ferdowsi today in Iran, you see all these images of you know, uh, the battles of Rostam, uh, the Scythian Mithraic hero uh, of the Shah Nameh, uh, engraved into, carved into the walls there. And this was built, this uh, uh, modern tomb, uh, modern uh, uh, parts of the tomb of Ferdosi were commissioned and built by Reza Shah Pahlavi, the first Pahlavi monarch, who, uh, as you may know, was allied with Hitler and consequently removed by the allied powers uh, and you know, forcibly exiled to Africa, um, where he died a miserable death. So uh, it's also not incidental that this Reza Shah, the first, Reza Pahlavi came again from Hyrcania. He comes from Savadku, 
which is a mountainous area around the Caspian Sea from that same uh, bastion of Mithraism. And he takes the name Pahlavi, which is the oldest um, Parthian uh, family designation. Now, uh, where I want to conclude, uh, more or less, is uh, with the order of assassins. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, golden age, this uh, flourishing of the arts and sciences, uh, who, the patrons of which were these Mithraists, extended from the 900s uh, through to about 1100. In, in 1100 and going into 1200, you had a, a kind of double whammy uh, you know, uh, come down on Iran in the form of the successive invasions of the Turks and the Mongols. So in two massive waves in the 1100s and then the 1200s, two closely related people, the Turks of you know, um, far uh, uh, Eastern Central Asia, the Turks from around the area of Kyrgyzstan and then the Mongols sweep into Iran and they are horrific destroyers of culture. These people, they, they basically create towers from out of heads uh, and torch hole libraries uh, and uh, ultimately adopt Sunni Islam as an instrument of totalitarian social control. And the people who hold out for the longest against them are the order of assassins led by Hassan Sabah at Alamut Fortress. This is a reconstruction of Alamut Fortress in the mountains around the Caspian, um, the province of Iran where this site is, Qazvin. Qazvin is a Turkic corruption of Caspian or Caspian. Uh, the Caspies were an archaic Iranian people. So this is in the mountainous region around the Caspian where we find the uh, only now the foundation courses are left of the fortress of the assassins, which was dismantled brick for brick by the Mongols. It was a place that featured an ast uh, astronomical observatory and numerous libraries. And why I'm bringing these people up is that if you study the Nizari Ismaili doctrine or the doctrine of the assassins led by Hassan Asaba, you will see Mithraic cosmology and Mithraic metaphysics all over it. These people, despite nominally identifying themselves as Muslims, believed in reincarnation. They believed in the Lord of time that one had to overcome. Uh, they were uh, uh, people who carried on the martial tradition of uh, Mithraism that you know, uh, was also passed on to Rome. And interestingly, in that connection, it appears that despite the fact that these assassins were fighting both the caliphate and the crusaders, they had a relationship with one particular group of crusader knights, the Knights Templar. It appears that the Knights Templar, unlike the other crusader knights who the assassins were waging war with, were actually on some esoteric level involved in uh, some project or some kind of a, a, a conspiracy with the order of assassins. So uh, one you know, area I think of uh, further inquiry uh, ought to be a potential connection between the Templar creed mm -hmm. and Mithraism uh, and a kind of triangulation between the assassin creed and the Templar creed uh, and Mithraism as a potential common point of origin and uh, basis for collaboration. So mm -hmm. after the fall of the order of assassins, you had Mithraism survive mostly in the poetic tradition of Iran uh, you'll see Mithraic symbolism all over uh, the poems of Hafez, who's uh, the most prominent national poet of Iran. Uh, like, for example, in this one uh, uh, poem, he writes, um, Should sorrow send forth an army, I and the friend shall together conspire to scale heaven's dome and draw down a new design. Uh, and the friend there is Mithra. Mithra was referred to as the friend. And the idea of scaling heaven's dome is the idea of ascending to the sphere of Zorvan and gaining control over the celestial machinery to become a master of your own destiny. And the flight to the celestial realm was through drinking may or, you know, Amanita laced wine. Okay, so uh, Hafez is a thoroughly Mithraic poet. Mm -hmm. And finally, the last uh, image I have here for you is of Shah Ismail Safavi. This is a, uh, the most accurate portrait of him that we have uh, that's uh, painted by Europeans. There was extensive commerce and diplomacy between, in particular, Venice and uh, the Safavids, because the Safavids were great allies of the Europeans against the Ottoman Caliphate. And so here's a portrait of Shah Ismail Safavi, who comes, again, from out of north uh, western Iran, and in particular, 
during a period when he was, uh, you know, very young still, he hadn't become king, he was a leader of a Sufi order, he takes refuge in the forests of Hyrcania and is initiated by Cryptomithraists before he ascends to the throne and becomes the founding king of the Safavid dynasty. And in particular, the group of people who initiated Shah Ismail in that part of Iran, uh, to this day, continue to worship Mithra in the form of the peacock angel. These are people who are referred to as um, the Ahla Haq, or the uh, people of truth or partisans of truth, very closely related to the Yazidis uh, in the Kurdish community in Northern Iraq. Uh, so I think that this um, uh, great efflorescence that we see in the Safavid period, this second Persian Renaissance and the uh, reunification of Iran as an empire for the first time in centuries that's instituted by Shah Ismail is yet again um, a, a uh, resurgence of Mithraism as, and is inspired by the Mithraic spirit, which, you know, a thousand years after the fall of Rome, more than a thousand years after the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire, was apparently alive and well enough in Iran to become the bedrock for another 300 year long Iranian empire, namely the Safavid Empire. And I'll end there and open it up to Q&A. Jason, um, what, once more you provided uh, a sumptuous uh, feast for um, um, minds and, and eyes that uh, was both satisfied and uh, uh, created a hunger for more. So I, I, I thank you um, uh, most sincerely, as I'm sure everyone else who has, has been present this evening would uh, uh, um, concur with. Uh, Wonderful, yeah, and you, you put in a great deal of time in in um, uh, composing that sequence of images, and it will be very good to look back at the the, the video because all, all all the books are are there, so they're very, they're very good references. So, thank thanks very much indeed for that. Um, thank you, sir. Um, questions, uh, I'm sure. Uh, right, I think, uh, may. Mehran, your your uh, uh, hand was yeah. up first, and then Tony, and uh, uh, no doubt other people. So, um, Mehran, pl yeah, please unmute and uh, ask your question. Thank you. Thank you once again. A great performance. Um, I um, hope we can have uh, more of these um, talks because uh, this is so relevant for our time, and there is so much potential in in, in these talks about how bridging the gaps, but uh, more important, how to become relevant. I wonder, if, in, in the beginning of your talks, you um, referred to those um, uh, initiation um, rites and uh, so on, and gave us a great, uh, you know, background. But um, I hoped you could um, discuss more about what happened after the French revolutionary project and what happened to America, the role of the, you know, Mithraism, obviously it has, you know, vanished from the surface and, and, and has become some kind of secret society thing. Otherwise it hadn't be uh, for the, you know, Freemasonry, you know, um, and, and Illuminati and those, you know, the societies, you know, communicating with outside world without, you know, uh, being so, uh, explicitly you know in their in their messages so i wonder how could we make emitraism relevant and i mean by this i mean there is so much potential one is this nero 666 it is so popular we know that kingdom of you know uh prince of darkness a king of persia a uh, harlot of Babylon, all those references as if there is a last chapter left in the Christian uh, era or narrative to be written by the very Mithraists. So I see a great role we can play in this apocalyptic world. So there is a great social and cultural and many capital, but what to do next? What will be the, be the next move? I hope, really hope, 
that we can have more of these talks because there is so many interpretations you can do uh, in the Holy Grail, in the Zodiac, in the, you know, those uh, seven stages. Because I see, the, as I told before, the three or maybe the four uh, in, uh, first stages as military stages, but the last stages is more religious. This morning I was thinking about, you know, the father, what the Germans call fatherland, and this Wotan and the Persian word Vatan, and um, Vatan Parast, you know that, Wotan priest. I mean, what is this holy nation we are thinking of, and all those things, and giving, you know, Persian, European, you know, uh, interpretations of that. And one last thing, you was talking about, you know, Knight Templars and, you know, the Project Egypt. I mean, I know your background is from Gorgon, the northeastern Iran. My background is from Gilan, the northwest, uh, western part, and this Buye, and, you know, this third Egyptian project. I mean, Persians conquered Egypt uh, during the Achaemenid time, and second time was during the Fatimites. And I think, you know, the third time will be the last one. And there is some kind of, you know, project, how to save the world, how to take, you know, control of, you know, major strongholds. Thank you for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you for this, your time. Okay. So a number of things. First, in order to make Mithraism relevant today, in terms of its doctrine and its potential to transform human consciousness. I think the kind of approach that needs to be taken toward Mithraism is the kind that Jung took toward Christianity, Gnosticism, the history of alchemy and so forth. And Jung also took astrology very seriously, by the way. I mean, he interpreted in terms of synchronicity and uh, the types of phenomena studied by parapsychologists, right? So even the astrological aspects of Mithraism can be translated into um, a more uh, intellectually robust context that's appropriate to the contemporary era by taking a Jungian archetypal psychology approach to uh, the symbols and the uh, cosmology of Mithraism, all right? Now, in terms of sociopolitics and the potential destiny of Mithraism that awaits fulfillment, I do agree with you that there is a relationship between Mithraism and what's often branded as the satanic from a Christian perspective. And in this way, Mithraism, or let's say Mithra as a symbol, is different from the resurgence of other pagan symbolism in Europe, right? Uh, in a way, one of the virtues of the Norse religion, which I wish I knew more about, after all, I'm partly Scandinavian by descent, partly Germanic. One of the virtues of the Norse religion is that it is sort of outside the whole dualistic scheme of Judeo-Christianity and of Abrahamic religion. It, it does not map neatly onto the kind of theology you see in the Abrahamic religions, whether that's Judeo-Christianity or Islam, right? It's its own thing. It stands in its own right. And in a way, that's a virtue. On the other hand, if your objective is to extricate Europe from Christianity, is to ultimately overcome Christianity on the scale of the entire Western world, if that's your objective, and frankly, it's mine, then you're going to need a resurgence of pagan symbolism, which is more adversarial and contrarian. And there are only two pagan deities that have that kind of power to invert Christianity. One is Mithra, and the other is that I've spent so much time focusing on, namely Prometheus. Okay, and there's a very close relationship between these two, Mithra and Prometheus. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I do think that there potentially could be a religious revolution that takes place in the West, 
which is not some kind of conversion of the West to Mithras. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. But in Nietzschean fashion, there can be an overcoming of Christianity that has an archaeofuturistic relationship with the symbols of Mithra and Prometheus. So that's, that's I think, a destiny of, of Mithraism that's waiting to be fulfilled. Let me leave it at that. Let me take other questions. Yeah, the, that is, is a fascinating answer, very uh, um, uh, suggestive. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, I think, Tony, you're, you're next, then it will be Vladimir, um, and uh, possibly by then other people will have raised hands. Um, Jason, um, I, I've uh, been interested in quite, for quite some time in the uh, connection between uh, the, the Templars and, and Freemasons. And um, I've done a lot of research on this, and I think there are some reasons to think that a very, there's a very close historical link. There's also a lot of uh, similarity between Mithraism and, temp uh, and uh, Freemasonry. Um, as you mentioned earlier, there's, there's, there's a, a, a lot of moments of commonality, um, which is something I've also done quite a bit of study on. The, the interesting thing is the Templars in the middle, what they might have had to do with Mithraism, how they might have um being the vehicles of it into freemasonry um and uh, i was wondering if you have a, an idea on this look i think you're exactly right i mean i didn't want to be boldly speculative uh although i mean i'm all, often boldly <laughs> speculative but but look i didn't want to uh, exceed the bounds of uh you know justifiable speculation but but i do suspect that you're exactly right the the way that all this mithraic symbology and ritual practice uh, wound up in masonry is via the conduit of the Knights Templar. That's the missing link. And that's why the Knights Templar had a relationship with the assassins who were also Mithraists. Yeah, so yeah. I suspect that's what we'll find when we, if we can dig into that very deeply. Yeah, the, the, the big, the big uh, problem um, if, uh, as an histor historian is to show how there could be a link between a, a 10th century organization and um, a, um, uh, a sect that uh, w became unknown four or 500 years earlier. Unknown in Europe. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. See, that's the thing. And also when yes. you say unknown in Europe, that's also not even accurate because remember- Well, no, it's, un it's, un it's underground movements still uh, visible, but it, it's, it's hard to show yeah. a direct link. Well, not even just underground. And I really want to belabor this and underline it, triple underline it. The Allens, I mean, Allen is one of the most common names in Europe because the Sarmatians who came to Europe, who were referred to as Allens by Europeans, the, and by the way, you know, I'll tell you the reason for that really briefly. In Iranian languages, L and R are often interchangeable. Like, you know how Japanese people say liri liri instead of really, really? And there's a flipping of an L and an R sound. Yeah, in these Iranian these language, are the Aryans. Yeah, exactly. So the yeah. Allens are the Arans. They're the Arans. And the, that uh, part of the Caucasus, which the Sarmatians came from originally is called Aran in mm. Iranian geography. So they're the Arans or the Aryans who came to Europe. Now, these people had a feudal fiefdom set up in, in uh, you know, the 1200s. The troubadours were being backed by these, uh, you know, uh, uh, as minstrels for these courts of Alan uh, women who would take care of the uh, property while the chivalric knights would go off, you know, to their various campaigns and so forth. So the, the Alanic culture, uh, which co-constituted the Merovingian and the Carolingian dynasties in France, the Alanic culture of Europe was Mithraic. So it's mm. not true that at the time that the Knights Templar was constituted, there was no Mithraism, Mithraism in Europe. It just there wasn't was being called that. Yeah. There was Mithraism 2.0, which yeah, was yeah. the Sarmatian form that was brought in, which included the worship of the inverted uh, broadsword and so on and so forth and the grail and okay so yeah. there was that and then Mithraism survived in Iran and of course the, the Templars were crusading into yeah. you know the Middle East so between what they may have gleaned from surviving Mithras in the Middle East and as Mehran said the order of assassins wasn't only in Iran Hassan Sabah studied in Egypt and the order of assassins extended all the way through Syria down into Egypt where, they, where uh, actually they created the Fatimid Caliphate. The Fatimid Caliphate, which was a, a, a adversary of the Baghdad Caliphate, was a, a, effectively a creation of this, this order, um, mm. later got out of their hands and so forth. But in any case, the area of the Middle East that the Templars came down into was populated by Iranian 
style Mithraists, and Europe was still a stronghold for Alans who were Sarmatian Mithraists. So there, there is a matrix, there is a cultural matrix there, contemporary mm. to the formation of the Knights Templar, which would account for them uh, having been a conduit for a transmission of Mithraic ideas to the Freemasons. Thank, mm. thank you for bringing that together. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that seems to make sense very much. Um, Vladimir, please. Uh, if you can un un unmute. All right. Okay, yes, Jason, first of all, thank you very much for your very interesting and informative talk. And there is the one issue of a special interest for me, and namely the influence of Western Gnosticism on uh, the Kala Chakra Tantra. So far I know, uh, in the 10th or 11th century, exactly in the time when the Kala Chakra Tantra have been written, there was an Ismaili state in the northern India, the Multan state. And so far I understand the Ismaili influenced the Kala Chakra Tantra, at least with their cosmology, very strong. And then later the Mongols picked up from Tibetans this cosmology and brought it to Mongolia and even to Yuan China. And uh, it influenced uh, even the, the Chinese inner alchemy, uh, including the white lotus sect. Uh, and so what should be your concern about this uh, interrelations and especially this Ismaili influence on Kala Chakra and basically on the on this uh, 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 Northern India culture. But I mean exactly the Buddhism first of all. Yeah, thank you. I got you. So uh, I think the influence is actually much older than what you're suggesting. It is true that Ismailis, in other words, what I've been referring to as the assassins, right? Ismaili esotericists did go to Northern India uh, and the um, Kali worship of the Thugis, for example, uh, the left-hand path uh, um, insurgents who fought the British in Northern India, their esoteric ideas have been traced to Ismaili influence as well. So you're right that there was an Ismaili influence in Northern India, but Tantra uh, dates back to about, as best as we can tell, the 600, 700 AD in Northern India going into present day Afghanistan, okay? Of course, again, Afghanistan is a totally artificial country. It's Eastern Iran. Um, and Padmasambhava, who is one of the first great tantric teachers and who takes tantra to Tibet, Padmasambhava was an Iranian, according to the best biographies. He came from what's present day Afghanistan, and there is a clear connection between the type of teachings that you see introduced into Buddhism uh, when Padmasambhava brings Buddhism to Tibet and the uh, erotic uh, countercultural practices, uh, antinomian taboo breaking practices that you saw in Mazdakism. So again, remember wh when did Mazdakism take over the Sassanid states? When did the, the Mazdakite form of the Mithraic religion become so powerful that it seized control of the state apparatus of Iran? 500 to 530 AD. Uh, when does Tantra begin to emerge in North Indian literature? Around 550, 600 AD, okay? And remember the Northern India for most of its history was ruled by Iranians. Even in ancient times, forgetting about the Persian eight culture of the Mughals and so forth, even in ancient times, the Kushans uh, who ruled Northern India were Iranian Scythians. So in addition to the various periods that Northern India spent under one or another Persian or Iranian empire, there were also quote unquote local dynasties in Northern India who were actually ethnically and culturally Iranian in origin and they were Mithras. So this, you know, th this was one cultural sphere and you have a Gnostic antinomian teaching take over the goddamn Iranian state in 500 AD, a doctrine which is almost identical to Carpocratian Gnosticism from Alexandria. And lo and behold, within a century, tantric texts appear in Northern India and Padmasambhava, who's an Iranian from Khorasan, 
takes these teachings to Tibet. So if you ask me, that's the genealogy there. All right. Yes, thank you. I've heard the Padma Sambha was even Zorvanist. Well, Zorvan, Zorvan is central to Mithraism. I think it's inaccurate to call him a Zorvanist, but he's someone to whom Zorvan was very important as you know, uh, the god of time in Mithraism. Oh. And remember, Padma Sambhava, look, the guy, I mean, people, I mean, you know, I don't know, these, these modern day Tibetan Buddhists with all their peace and love, new agey nonsense, for, you know, Lucifer's sake, read the biography of Padma Sambhava. The guy was a warlord who drank out of skulls in cemeteries, <laughs> okay? And would go as a master archer, sit on rooftops and take aim at people to kill them so that he could take their women. This guy fits the uh, type of a Mithraic champion, a Mithraic knight perfectly. Padmasambhava is a hardcore Mithraist in, in essence, in his ethos. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Um, Michael uh, from Cologne. Yeah, please, please yeah. Uh, un unmute. Um, yeah, anyone else who hasn't uh, asked a question, uh, I I'm always keen to get as many voices um heard as possible uh yeah please michael go ahead yes i was uh, extremely interested in that talk as i'm sure most people here were and um, one question i do have concerns uh, the legend of the of the dragon and the knight it seems to be very much entrenched in uh, christian mythology that the hero is the dragon slayer i mean we have saint george for example saint george and the dragon we have also um in heathenism, uh, we have Siegfried, the, he's the dragon slayer, and the dragon is, is portrayed as, as some sort of uh, um, almost, uh, would I say, can't think of the right words, or avatar of evil. And I wanted to know in, to what extent um, the dragon is regarded as such in Mithraism, because you also mentioned the use of the dragon symbol by the Roman legions who'd converted to Mithraism, so I'm a little bit confused. Uh, where one stands there is regarding the knight and the dragon and in respect of Mithraism as well. Right. So as I mentioned, uh, in Iran, you have a perfect corollary to these European images of knights slaying dragons. Um, mm. The Shahnameh is full of images of uh, Persian knights uh, going to battle against dragons. And I think that this is a represent, it's an iconographic translation of battles with Sarmatians. The Sarmatian was the, sorry, the dragon uh, was the standard of the Sarmatians. And the dragon is inextricably associated with the goddess figure who dwells beneath the lake, Shatana oh. or Satana. So uh, both the Sarmatians and the Scythians worship this mother and consort uh, and initiatrix figure of Mithra. She's, she's viewed as the mother and or the consort, in other words, the, the woman through whom Mithra gives birth to himself, and also the initiatrix or like uh, basically martial trainer of uh, Mithra and of Mithraic knights. This figure is depicted by both uh, Scythians and closely related Sarmatians as a goddess entwined by serpents like Medusa. I mean, the Gorgons were Mithraic goddess figures who were demonized by the Greeks. So Satana or Shatana, the lady of the lake, master sorceress and, and uh, military initiatrix is the dragon mother. I call her the dragon mother of chivalric Iran in my uh, Iranian Leviathan. Uh, and so I think what you're seeing in, um, you know, this, uh, dragon slaying symbolism in Europe is not just battles with Sarmatians who were bearing a uh, you know dragon standard, many of which such battles took place. Right, you're, you're seeing battles with Sarmatians being depicted, but on a deeper level, you're seeing a kind of more traditionalist, patriarchal, pagan uh, ethos uh, rubbing up against a more matriarchal, albeit fierce. Mithraic religion that's coming in from Asia. Uh, and you saw this with the Greek battles against Gorgons as well. So I, I think that's what's going on there. Now, to me, the really interesting uh, element in all that is that 
the, the Scythians are vastly ancient people. The Scythians came through the Middle East, oh, as early as 800 BC, okay? All through the Middle East, not just Iran. They, they rampaged their way to Egypt from out of Northern Iran, about 800 BC. I don't think it's coincidental that the serpent depicted in the Eden story, who's actually a dragon, it's clear if you study the Bible properly, that the serpent who is punished by having his legs taken away and who is identified later as the dragon of the apocalypse and, the de and Satan himself, right? That that serpent is Satan. And we've been told that the word Satan is just the word for adversary in Hebrew, namely shaitan. Okay, but there is a shaitana, the shaitana who was symbolized by the dragon and worshiped by the Sarmatians and the Scythians, the lady of the lake. So I wonder really whether, uh, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the Satan of the Bible is actually this uh, dragon mother figure who is a bearer of wisdom and who is an uh, initiatrix of uh, Promethean champions, okay? And so you see in the demonization of this figure, an early culture clash between the Scythians coming into the Middle East and the Semites who were the native inhabitants of you know, the Eastern Mediterranean. So that's what I would have to say about the, the dragon and dragon slaying. Um, and uh, and a, a, one last note, the order of the dragon, let's not forget, defended Europe from the Turks the worst enemy of the Sarmatians and the Scythians were the Turks. It's the Turks who pushed the, Sarm the Scythians and then the Sarmatians further and further to the West from out of their uh, you know, uh, homeland of Central Asia, further and further into the West, into the collapsing Roman empire. And ultimately uh, you know, they set up uh, you know, these fiefdoms in medieval Europe, right? So the, the Sarmatians were being chased constantly by the Turks and at a certain point, they just drew a line in Romania and in Hungary and uh, turned around and basically impaled as many of these uh, Ottomans as they could and defended the European Renaissance uh, in its cradle in Italy. It pre prevented it from being snuffed out by you know, the uh, Muslim Caliphate, which it certainly would have been. So I think Europe owes a great debt to the order of the dragon, which is uh, Sarmatian and Mithraic in origin. Mm. Very, very, very well put. Um, Claire. Claire, are you, are you uh, get going to unmute and ask Jason? Um, does, does it, um, uh, Edward, did, did you have a, have a question? Oh, yeah, please, please, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I took a while to, to find all the buttons and oh, get okay. back to the right window. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, th th um, thank you, Jason. Um, I wonder if you could tell us what your religion was before, before all this. What my religion was? My religion has always been philosophy. <laughs> um, to, to be quite honest with you, and I mean, I've written this elsewhere, so I'm not saying anything new, but... Uh, I think if you aspire to, to be a philosopher, uh, let alone if you actually succeed in becoming one, um, your religion has to be the pursuit uh, of wisdom and the reverence for wisdom. And so uh, to the extent that Prometheus is a titan of wisdom or to the extent that uh, Mithra is a you know, uh, titanic uh, wisdom bringing God, bearer of enlightenment, and so forth. These are um, theological symbols that are consistent with the philosophical life. Uh, that's what I would say. Uh, let me add to that, though, uh, especially since I've launched a whole project uh, under the name of Prometheism, namely Prometheus Theism, uh, that I think there's a lot of truth in what Plato says in Republic about the vital role that religion plays as the um, binding agent of a society. The and, noble lie. Well, uh, I think philosophers ought to be tasked with the proper spiritual orientation of a society uh, and that we could do a lot better 
um, if philosophers were the ones who were spiritually orienting uh, society and uh, structuring a political system rather than blind adherence of some supposed revelation from the skies. So you're, you're creating a priesthood of philosophers. That, that's kind of what you're proposing, isn't it? That would be nice. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. But, but how is one to measure uh, wisdom? Uh, look, I mean, this brings you back to arguments against Plato and arguments within the Platonic dialogues. You're never going to find some uh, objective uh, standard uh, or some you know, irrefutable criterion uh, for who ought to be in a position of power based on their putative wisdom, right? Uh, but we don't even in the world today have an aspiration for a political system that's guided by the wise rather than guided by uh, basically uh, crime syndicates and uh, corporatist looters and uh, you know, very like openly corrupt politicians. Uh, so, you know, the first step is to abandon false ideals like mobocracy, i.e. democracy, uh, and the, the reign of, of capital, uh, and at least aspire to a system where, you know, uh, guidance is being provided by those who ostensibly have dedicated themselves to uh, the acquisition of knowledge and the pursuit of wisdom. Thank you very much. That, that, that's a very, very good answer. Um, forgive me, Claire, I, I, I will m m move on. Um, Edward, please. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Jason. That was a superb presentation, and I am a big fan of yours. Um, <laughs> I've seen many of your YouTube um, talks, and I've read some of your books as well. Um, my, my question's slightly different. Um, I'm really interested in your creative process. Um, because you're a very fluid talker and writer, and you obviously deeply study texts, histories, mythologies, archaeology, etc. Um, so you're really immersed in your subjects. Um, but do you, in a sense, do you almost connect with these teachers from the past, embody them, and do they influence you in your creative process? Do you feel that they're almost coming through you, in a sense? I'm not being, um, you know, silly with this point. I really am uh, being very serious about it. You know, do, do you feel that you connect with them and that your creative process too is, is really, really important to you, not just about finding out from the past and um, explaining what has happened in the past and bring it into the present, but, but your creative process as well. I hope that's uh, okay. Yeah. Um... Look, um, I want to be a little bit careful how I answer this question, but uh, uh, I have intuitions about history, which certainly ought not to be the basis of making claims without their being substantiated by extensive research, but they're the kind of intuitions mm. which allow you to see patterns in uh, historical and sociological data that someone else might not necessarily see. And um, I agree with the Mithraists that reincarnation is, you know, part of uh, the uh, dynamics of the development of the human psyche. Um, and I say that on the basis of uh, extensive scientific evidence for reincarnation that's been uh, marshaled by people like Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia in decades mm -hmm. of research. So, um, you know, if reincarnation is a legitimate phenomena, which I think it is, uh, and uh, we've spent um, lifetimes in other epochs of history, uh, there may at least be a latent subconscious memory of certain things that would be uh, triggered by um, a, uh, you know, a deep study of, of certain eras in terms of, you know, rigorous scholarship, right? So that's one answer that I would give to you. And another thing that I would add to that is that my creative process is very much that of an artist. Had I not gone into philosophy, I'd have gone into visual art, um, drawing or painting. And uh, one of the reasons that I didn't become a painter um, or, you know, is because I think that until we have a fundamental philosophical and spiritual reorientation of our culture, art will remain dead. Okay, for art to be revitalized again, on a scale that's socially significant 
and where art can have the sacred uh, symbolic power that it did to most societies throughout history, there needs to be a fundamental philosophical uh, reorientation of our uh, dying civilization. So um, the way I work in terms of my writing is the way that a painter paints. Uh, it's not, you know, incremental, putting together little puzzle pieces or something like that. It's in terms of forming a gestalt, like a, you know, a painter uh, sketching out broad contours, uh, demarcating broad contours on a canvas and zooming in on one or another area and filling in detail. Uh, and as in the case of a painter, it involves a lot of intuition, which I already addressed. Intuition mm -hmm. relevant to you. Um, a not entirely rational understanding of history. Okay, and an experience of time uh, that's, um, that, uh, that, that transcends the confines of uh, the contemporary materialistic reductionistic paradigm prevalent in the science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good question. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the answer. Um, th those who, who haven't asked uh, any question, I don't know, if, uh, F Father Frank maybe, uh, Helen, Isabel, um, Kem, Adam, Mick, Edith, Alan. Uh, I'm I'm conscious that um, uh, Jason's been entertaining us for two hours, so I, I'm keen to um, end this fairly soon. But uh, 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 yeah, if if no one um, new has any. Uh, more questions. I'm uh, uh, Frank. Are you are you unmuting to to ask a question? No, I, I don't think so. Um, if yeah, if 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 no one will, I I, I think maybe we should uh, uh, move move towards the cl close of the meeting, which has been fascinating. One one thing Michael from uh, from Cologne did mention in chat um, is a reading list, but I I, I suppose. Uh, just looking back at the um, recording would perhaps serve. Do you think, Jason? Because most of the books that seem to have been significant, you've actually pictured. Yeah, the covers of uh, mm. the most significant texts on Mithraism are all in that presentation. You know, from like uh, you know Yulansi and and mm. Payam Nabarz's books on Mithras to you know the books on um, the the resurgence of Mithraism in Iran in the medieval period and the dynamics of power between the Parthians and the Sassanids and so forth. All those books are, are pictured there. And if you want a more extensive book list, well, look at the biography in, um, biography, sorry, the bibliographical ref references, look at the bibliography in Iranian Leviathan. There's an extensive bibliography. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the book is subtitled A Monumental History of Mithra's Abode. So it's essentially a study of Mithraism and not only um, a book about Iranian history. Mm. I'm, I'm certainly uh, intending to re re read that after after the, the, these two um, moots. Um, Jason, uh, uh, do, do, you, do you have the uh, uh, text of the... Yep. Right. Um, Roger um, Kipling wrote several short stories set in the Roman Empire where the heroes are followers of Mithras and they are loyal Romans and foster an orderly society and an appreciation of other people's points of view, uh, that there are many ways to the light, unlike the Christian characters who are genuinely less of a positive influence. Three years ago, I visited uh, the London Mithraeum on the very auspicious day of the 24th of December with a Druid friend of mine, um, uh, a, a man who I think several people here uh, are familiar with. When in the darkness the lights were, were lit, we both stood up and read Kip, uh, Roger Kipling's song to Mithras. And I think it would be an appropriate way to end this evening's moot if Jason would uh, would read that. Mithras, God of the Morning. Our trumpets waken the wall. Rome is above the nations, but thou art over all. Now, as the names are answered and the guards are marched away, Mithras, also a soldier, give us strength for the day. Mithras, God of the noontide, the heather swims in the heat. 
Our helmets scorch our foreheads, our sandals burn our feet. Now in the ungirt hour, lest we blink and drowse, Mithras, also a soldier, keep us true to our vows. Mithras, god of the sunset, low on the western main, thou descending immortal, immortal to rise again. Now when the watch is ended, now when the wine is drawn, Mithras, also a soldier, keep us pure till the dawn. Mithras, god of the midnight, here where the great bull dies, look on thy children in darkness. Oh, take our sacrifice. Many roads thou hast fashioned, all of them lead to light. Mithras, also a soldier, teach us to die aright. Thank you very much uh, for an ending that I don't think could be bettered. Um, th thanks so much for, for your, your generosity of time and the, the, uh, with all the work you put into the presentation, which, which um, I, I think we will all watch several times with profit. Um, thanks everyone for coming, for um, keep, uh, uh, um, keeping here to the end of of uh, what what's been over over, over two hours um so thanks um again and uh yeah uh, uh, all, all, all the best uh with your work jason are you working on anything at, at the moment uh book wise i'm always working on something <laughs> i've got another book in the oven thank Excellent. you it's really been my pleasure to spend this time with you all and uh, i look forward to seeing you all again before too long Excellent. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.